Welcome back to UC Davis Live. I'm Saturius Johnson. The global system of supply and demand is still going through some pains with container ships backed up at ports, unexpected shortages in stores and rising prices. What's going on with the supply chain for food and other products? What does it mean for the economy and the upcoming holiday season? Joining us today to talk about these issues are two economists from UC Davis. Katie Russ is a professor of economics with expertise in open economy macroeconomics and international trade. She's a faculty research associate in the National Bureau of Economic Research, International Trade and Investment Group. And she served as senior economist for international trade and finance at the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Dan Sumner is the Frank H. Buck Jr. Distinguished Professor of Agricultural and Resource Economics at UC Davis and former director of the University of California Agricultural Issues Center. His work focuses particularly on the consequences of farm, food, and trade policy on agriculture and the economy. He's also served as Assistant Secretary for Economics at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Welcome to you both. So if you're watching us live, I just want to uh, remind our, our viewers that we are taking your questions live. Just leave them in the comments section and we'll work in as many as we can. So Katie, let's start with you. Um, let's start with something very basic, a brief kind of description of, of what we mean when we talk about supply chain. So the supply chain is everything from when a good is going through different stages of production to when it gets to the point where it's being transported either between these stages of production or for final purchase and consumption somewhere. And that involves everything from, from, from the production to transportation of, of parts to transportation to the final product, all of those things are involved. Exactly, yeah. And also um, transport into the retail sector and then uh, getting into the consumer's cart. Right, right. So transportation plays a big role in this supply chain. Um, and we've been experiencing problems with supply chains for well over a year now. So what, what are the problems plaguing the system right now? Are they the same issues that we saw in the beginning of this? So there, there are some issues that are still persisting from the beginning, like sporadic um, shutdowns of factories or reduced capacity due to pandemic related reasons. But really right now we see transport kicking in in a big way on the supply side. Um, but that, to just put it in context, that's largely driven by this surge in demand. So if you think about how many containers are coming through the port of LA in 2019, between January and October, it was a little less than 4 million containers. This year, January to October, it was closer to 5 million containers. That's a lot <laughs> of containers. So uh, we see this surge in the volume of goods being demanded, imported, imported from elsewhere, but also um, that we're trying to transport through the country. Right. And the problem is um, the kind of the disassociation between the supply and the demand, right? So the so demand has risen during the pandemic, but supply hasn't been able to keep up for various reasons. Yeah, so two things occurred. So first we had a massive shift away from services and toward goods as we all tried to adapt to the new conditions under the pandemic. And so you see this big shift away from services and toward goods in personal consumption expenditures. Right now, um, we're, that, that expenditure on services is rebounding. It's still below trend uh, compared to where it would have been if it had kept growing like it was before the pandemic started. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's definitely recovering and getting back to normal. Um, the demand for goods is still quite elevated. So we have this huge surge in demand for goods in part due to pandemic adaptation, also partly driven by the enormous stimulus that was pumped through the economy to try to keep, to try to um, get the economy going again and then sustain the most vulnerable households who really were hit the hardest in the beginning of the pandemic. And so all of us have a bit more cash circulating through our bank accounts, or maybe not all of us, but a lot of us have a, um, more cash than we would have without the stimulus uh, circulating through our bank accounts. And that is really helping to buoy this demand, at least for the time being. Mm -hmm. So what effect do, do these issues have on the rest of the economy, uh, you know, this whole supply chain problem? Well, you do see uh, manufacturers, uh, retailers having issues uh, getting their goods in when they when they ex usually would expect them. So the time to ship from China to the US, for instance, um, before the pandemic was about 40 days. Uh, it peaked um, this fall at 73 days, uh, according to Freitos. So 
you know, they're having to wait um, longer for goods in some cases, but then also this is kind of an average in the, the increase of the uh, transport time. We don't always know which goods will show up at a particular time when. Um, now, this is much more idiosyncratic than the broader supply shortages that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, we all remember shelves empty of key goods, and those, those shortages lasted for a long time. These are more idiosyncratic. Occasionally, we do see critical goods like certain medical supplies affected, and so that can be very serious. But for the most part, these shortages are, they're, um, you know, it's, it's not this sweeping phenomenon like we saw at the beginning of the pandemic during the, the big lockdowns. Right. Uh, we are taking your questions. Again, if you're watching us live, just leave them in the comments section and we'll work in as many as we can. Uh, Dan, what's driving increases in food prices, both in the U.S. and globally? Well, it, it's some of what Katie talks about and, and then a, a number of things that are also affecting other, other parts of the economy, but are particularly important in, in food and agriculture. Uh, and I would say if you look at individual costs of inputs, uh, there, are, there are things like labor, of course, is, is, is a, a huge input cost in the food system, starting with farm labor, but all the food service uh, and, and retailing part of, of the food system also face higher costs for labor and labor availability. And, and we uh, see that in our daily lives as well. Input costs have also gone up uh, at the farm material input costs. And some of that is supply chain related and some of it not. Uh, natural gas prices are higher. Well, that's mostly a local within the, within the United States phenomena here but Europe also has high natural gas prices. Uh, farms don't uh, use some natural gas, but it's especially the fertilizer, which turns out is made by natural gas. So uh, nitrogen fertilizers are made by natural gas, natural pr gas prices go up, farm prices go up, and it traces through the food system. So we're seeing some of those things. One thing I would emphasize that's important within agriculture and especially California agriculture is these supply chain disruptions affect exports as well as imports. And uh, California is a big agricultural exporter. And there the problem is uh, finding the containers to ship out. So uh, we have delayed, uh, uh, hopefully uh, people in the industry are hoping it's just delays in exports of almonds and pistachios and walnuts and down the line uh, because they need to get that product uh, to, to their destinations around the world. And that goes on to, to dry milk powder and tomato paste, all the things that you, you know we grow here in California. Much of that gets exported. And if the, 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 there's very specific things going on in the ports that mean that empty containers that would normally be filled up with stuff that we produce here in California end up rushing back to Asia empty so that they can begin the cycle again. And that's uh, been a real complication for exporters. And there have been cases actually where, you know, farmers have the, the nuts to export, but they haven't been able to get them out. Oh, there's no question. There's, there's a, a backup of inventory here. Uh, and, and that's, that's a problem all over, uh, all over uh, the United States. I will say California tends to be more, what we produce tends to be more con container connected than the Midwest grains and oil seeds or Canadian canola and wheat uh, where, where they're going out in a different kind of shipping. So they're a little bit different. Uh, and and those, those Midwest kind of bulk products uh, uh, might well be going out of ports uh, that are less congested because they're less focused on the container side of things. There's right. one thing I do wanna say, and it, you could call this a silver lining if you wanted, uh, if exporters have a hard time getting it out of the United States, that means availability is a little larger here. It's bad news for the exporter, but it does mean that those of us that uh, may, may find slightly lower price of pistachios here in California, uh, be, it's bad news for the pistachio industry, but it's good news for those of us. Uh, that's not a big deal, but uh, if you look for silver lining, the silver linings, of course, not everyone gains or loses when, when things are disrupted. There, it, there's a distribution of effects. Right. 
I was going to ask you, um, as far as rising food prices go, I mean, you've talked about some that might be lower for people in the U.S., like where, with yeah, the nuts that can't get out. Um, but do you know, is, there, is this a general increase or are there some crops or foods especially affected when it comes to rising prices? You know, we're seeing prices uh, go up for, for some items and not for others. Everything that's affected by uh, labor shortages in the food system will go up a bit. And so food, food prices are substantially higher. But there's been a lot of news about meat prices and, and, and um, turkey, for example, over Thanksgiving, people talked about it. And some people are still talking about uh, going into the next holiday. Well, uh, those are basically uh, corn and soybeans and, and grains. Those prices are high partly because the export market for them has been booming in Asia. As, as, uh, uh, so we ship a bunch of grain to Asia. They feed their livestock with that grain. That makes grain prices here. And the economy coming back worldwide has caused those, those underlying agricultural farm commodities to be higher. And that filters in, particularly, in the, particularly into the meat side of things. Uh, we also have, and I think we all agree it was great news, we've provided a little more uh, space for workers in meatpacking plants. It's safer now. They've had to slow the lines a little bit, but it's more expensive. It's not free. And we're paying for that at the supermarket. And I think that's the sort of thing that, uh, uh, to the extent that consumers know that, we say, yeah, we want those jobs to be safe. And if it is a little more costly, so be it. Right. So uh, I'd like to ask both of you, which products do you think may have had the largest price increase as we enter this holiday season? Katie, why don't we start with you? Well, Dan just said it. I mean, meat is definitely one of them. Meat prices have gone up 20% or more for certain products. Um, in addition, uh, new and used cars have really been a big driver of inflation. But if you look down the list in the October release from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the number that really pops out is for gasoline. So we're looking at an increase of 50% over last year. At the same time, that can be a little bit misleading because prices for energy products actually fell during the pandemic, so fell during 2020. So when we're comparing it just to last year, we're comparing it to a, a, a trough. And that um, holds for some other prices too. So if we're thinking about, you know, how much costs are increasing per year just compared to last year, it's 6.1%. If we're thinking about how much prices have increased at an annual rate, but compared to two years ago, then it's 3.7% at an annualized rate. So, you know, it's, it really matters what you pick as the point of comparison. If you pick the depths of the lockdown recession, then you're going to say that, oh yeah, inflation is really, really high. And, you know, that's, that's pretty eye popping. But if you compare it to a more, a more normal time, 2019, then it, it's, you know, it's still high, it's still elevated, um, but it, it's not so eye popping. And to follow and in up addition on, to the meat, is there anything else that is really standing out as far as, you know, inflation? Yeah, that moderation, you know, if you're comparing to one versus two years ago, that doesn't really seem to apply to food prices because they didn't fall during the pandemic. We all started buying more food for consumption at home, um, and those were really sustained. There were other supply issues that Dan is much more export, expert about than I am. Um, so, yeah, that doesn't really explain why meat's up 20%, <laughs> I'm afraid, but yeah. It, it, and K Katie raises a good point. Food prices are, are generally volatile. And, and frankly, this is agriculture. So we're talking about the weather. Uh, you get great weather in the Midwest. You have a lot of corn. The corn prices go by and we all find out pork chops are cheap. Uh, and, and it's really just that kind of fluctuation. Uh, and, and supply and demand around the world. We're talking about the international market here. And that's especially true for lots of food items. This time of year, uh, we're bringing uh, fruits and vegetables up from Mexico and South America. Fortunately, a lot of that doesn't go through the port of Los Angeles or, or Long Beach. Uh, you know, it's coming by truck from Mexico. And so we've been OK on that score. Uh, but the other thing to recognize, and, and one reason people are hesitant to, to think about underlying inf causes of inflation uh, being the, what they point to when it comes to food, 
is that a lot of the food costs really are vol volatile from year to year. We have a freeze in, in, uh, uh, in the Southern San Joaquin Valley, uh, orange or, or Clementine prices go up, little cuties cost more. And, and we understand exactly how that stuff happens and they'll be lower the next year and it's not really inflation. They go up and down and we're used to that fluctuation. It, uh, what's, what's different this time may well be uh, a whole level of input costs across all businesses that have gone up. That is the input prices to businesses have gone up and to the extent that then that leads to their costs going up, then we see it at the supermarket and that's not gonna come back down again, probably. That's a part of the overall increase of the supply chain. Right, and by input, input costs, you mean things that the final product need uh, to be created, right? Whether yeah. it's you know, uh, a part or a, uh, an element or a, the labor that goes into it, those are all input costs. Or as we've all learned, microchips to make automobiles. You know, right, we, right. We, we didn't used to think of microchips as a crucial input to automobiles. We used to think it was steel, but, but it's, it's, you know, it's surprising uh, the sorts of things. Uh, I remember, uh, so, so the cost of irrigation water uh, here in California, you say, gee, I don't, I don't drink that much water. Well, I'm sorry, when irrigation water prices go up, you're gonna pay a little more for food. Maybe not a lot more, but a little more for food. And, and we, those sort of things go on around the economy. Right, right. You know, you mentioned trucking. I know trucking has really been a big issue the last, over the last year, as far as, um, I'll, you know, these trucking companies are having a hard time finding drivers. Um, why, wh how did that, why did that happen? What's behind that? Well, it's not too different from what we're seeing at the port. I mean, more stuff is being moved in trucks. And in fact, part of the backup, part of the problem with the backup at the port is that there aren't enough drivers to get um, the containers onto trucks and then out of the port area. So you're getting these loaded containers just stuck at the port and um, companies are actually being fined for having these loaded containers sitting at the port and, and not, not taken out. So uh, the shortage of drivers is really, again, related to this surge in demand, this increase in the volume of products being moved. Um, we do have a tighter labor, mar labor market generally, though. And I'm sure you've read the articles about the great resignation. I mean, millions more workers are quitting their jobs than we would have expected, um, given uh, economic conditions. So this is, it's interesting because we're running this hot economy uh, with the surge in demand. Um, workers are really taking a step back. They're either concerned about childcare, they're concerned about the virus, they're reevaluating um, what they want out of their job or what they, what they want to do with their careers after this shock of the pandemic that we've all lived through together. Uh, and what's interesting, I find, is that, and this is different than last year, we're seeing wage growth for the lowest quarter, the lowest, um, so the, the quarter of workers who are earning the lowest wages, those wages are growing the fastest. So they're still not quite keeping up with inflation, which is worrisome, right? We, we don't like to see that happen. But at the same time, they're growing at the fastest rate that they have since the Great Recession hit, and they're growing far faster than the top earners. So this is something really interesting. And you were saying, you know, are economists just rethinking inflation or, you know, how is this kind of um, falling out? Well, we're starting to wonder as macroeconomists if it's worth running a hotter economy longer. So you'll notice that the Federal Reserve Bank has not stepped in yet and started raising interest rates as they normally would if inflation was 6.1%. <laughs> They're saying, okay, yeah, maybe next year, you know, that means that we're going to start raising interest rates sooner than we thought, but they're still talking about next year. They're not talking about the next meeting of the Federal Open Market Committee that decides what the interest rates are going to be. And that's because when they start raising interest rates, that does cool the economy, and it tends to hit the most vulnerable workers first, um, those low, low wage earners first. And instead, they're letting things run faster, longer, uh, and we see this elevation of the, the wages of the lowest earning workers, and it's actually accelerating. So we'll see if that trend continues. But I think this is a um, really interesting um, time to think about worker bargaining power, which is 
been eroding over the last few decades. Um, you know, are things turning around now with this great resignation, with the labor shortages that we see? Is that going to finally push wages up so that, you know, the the um, workers who are in the lower half of the wage earning distribution actually get to partake more in the benefits of economic growth? Right, almost like a a, a silver lining in all of this. It might yep. be the people who need. Uh, to earn a living wage might actually get there. Yes, I don't want to be too Pollyanna-ish about it because, I mean, we still have issues with people that don't have access to health insurance through their jobs. They don't have a living wage through their jobs. Uh, we still have uh, a, a real issue with time poverty, you know, people having to work multiple jobs with not steady shifts. You know, the shifts can be at any time of day or night for any length of time. So so I don't want to, you know, be, be uh, overly you know, glossy about this. But at the same time, we do seem to see this shift in worker bargaining power, um, you know, associated with this great resignation with the shortage in truck drivers, you know, will that result in increased wages and bonuses for truck drivers? I mean, you hope so. Right, and, right. And and a part of that, uh, particularly for the for low, relatively low wage workers that Katie just highlighted, a lot of them are in the food system. And we, the other thing that some people don't recognize enough is that there was a, a really substantial transfer of income attempt to, to try to keep people whole during the uh, pandemic and, and savings went up and people in a sense have a little more, a little more access to cash. Uh, additional pandemic payments uh, made this year in 2021 uh, after the labor market had tightened already and that gives some people more flexibility to not just resign and go to the next job or do something else, but take some time away from the labor market. So we've seen labor market participation going up, or excuse me, labor, par labor market participation going down. At the same time, uh, there's this uh, uh, crying need for more workers. So, you know, as we see prices going up, partly that reflects that we've taken tax money and, and frankly, lots of borrowing to move money to some people and in the form of food stamps or cash or something uh, that in a sense makes them whole, but it does give them the flexibility to turn down a job. And, you know, it, and that's a, a flexibility that uh, people need, uh, frankly, if, if they're gonna uh, go on to the next improvement of jobs. I think it's important to note, though, while, it, while Dan's absolutely right, there has been a uh, beefing up of uh, household savings um, in the wake of the, uh, the infusions of cash through the rescue, the federal rescue packages. At the same time, there's very little evidence that the beefed up social safety net that um, that we saw also coming out of the ref rescue packages. So he mentioned food stamps, uh, also extended unemployment uh insurance, a little bit of a bonus in, in uh, unemployment insurance during the pandemic. There's very little evidence that that has had any influence on the labor market um, itself in terms of the number of workers quitting or the number of workers leaving the labor force. Um, and labor force participation has been declining since the 1950s for men uh, and, and the last couple decades for, for women. So this is a longer term trend about labor force participation that it's a structural issue that we really have to address as a society as a whole. And is probably, as he mentions, exacerbating um, you know, the labor market shortages we're seeing now. Right. And we've got generational shifts going on. We, we all know uh, uh, we have baby boomers that were nearing retirement already, many of them already retired. And, and there are people that uh, found their jobs went away during the, the depth of the pandemic, who then reevaluated whether it was worthwhile going back in, into the labor market. Uh, and, and my only point is people have to, they have to get by. And we have lots of people in this economy who, uh, who are, who are desperate to have the income. And, and that's one reason they end up working at jobs that frankly aren't particularly attractive to them or to anyone else. And if they have any flexibility uh, because of a safety net, that does give them more flexibility to reconsider uh, different kinds of jobs. And 
but what I mean is that it's not the safety net that's actually correlated with the quits. Um, so we find at most a very small marginal effect um, yeah. when we look at, you know, rollouts of changes in unemployment benefits or something like that and, and correlate those with what's going on with quits and, um, and, and labor market participation. Uh, I mean, in terms of the the tax credits and so forth, increasing savings, you know, that's that's a different story. Um, but in terms of unemployment insurance and the safety net itself, unemployment insurance, uh, food stamps, that does not seem to be what's driving the the major phenomena we see in the labor market right now. So I think it's important to distinguish between those two. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and um, I think this is a great segue to it, is that do you think that the spending bills uh, recently passed by Congress might have some impact on these issues, whether it's supply chain or inflation? Would you like to go first? David? Oh, I, I, I just can... say that, you know, those are, uh, when you talk about two or $3 trillion, it, it or, or, or however much it turns out to be, um, Every one of those bills have lots and lots of specifics. Uh, there's uh, tens of billions of dollars for farm subsidies wrapped within those things. And there are, there are myriad other very specific programs. And I don't think anybody uh, has their head around all the different things in there. I'll let Katie speak to whether or not that if it really is a two or three billion dollars or trillion dollars of added spending over some period of time that wouldn't otherwise have been made. Uh, I'll let her speak to the macroeconomics of that. So when we think about the, the price tag as a whole, um, like uh, Dan was saying, I think the latest one was $1.5 $1 trillion, but yeah, it's two, $3 trillion that we're getting into if we add them all together. But this latest one um, that's uh, on the, you know, on the table, it's, that's over a 10 year period. So the overall price tag looks huge, but on an annual basis, you know, it, it's really quite modest by historical standards. Um, one thing that is very promising for supply chains within the, the infrastructure package that was just passed is there is quite a bit of money uh, there to enhance our port capacity. So to deepen, widen the port so that they can accommodate um, larger, uh, more, uh, either more ships or larger ships. Um, also uh, tackling issues in our inland waterways to help facilitate um, water transport there. Money to help fix um, roads, highways, bridges, tunnels. Um, so these are also things that can slow transport and, and muck up the supply chain. So all of this is, is, is quite important and over the long term should help enhance supply chain resilience. So this is for next time, not for this time. But we don't want anybody to think uh, uh, we're gonna have uh, new roads by, by next uh, February or something. That's it's, true. It's gonna be a while. That's true. Yeah. But if we think about also the labor that's gonna be needed to make these improvements, that may end up further increasing bargaining power of workers. So that is going to increase demand for workers to be building these roads and, and bridges and, and widening these ports. So it will be interesting to see, especially if those jobs, um, if you know, there's a large percentage of non-college educated workers who um, are, are, are pulled in um, to those jobs, like that could, again, help bring up wages for um, the bottom half of the the wage distribution, which would which would be, which would be kind of exciting to see some improvements in the worsening inequality that that we've observed uh, for some decades in the U.S. So you know, before we wrap up, I, I was hoping to get from each of you how how do each of you see the outlook for inflation and the economy in general for 2022? I know that's the big question. Um, yeah, let's start with you, Katie outlook for 2022. So you can expect these uh, largely demand driven um, supply chain issues to continue um, through, I would imagine, the first half of 2022. Um, the, and that's because it's going to still take a while. As long as the pandemic persists, we're still going to be concentrating our expenditures um, disproportionately on goods. So that, that spending on services, it's not quite up to trend yet. And as long as that lasts, you know, 
this is going to happen. The other thing is, as long as the pandemic persists globally, so as long as the rest of the world is not vaccinated um, and doesn't have the same access to vaccines that we have, you're going to see that same sluggish response in supply um, that we've seen in some sectors. So that's going to continue to be a problem. And it seems like it's at least, I mean, there doesn't seem to be a sweeping effective plan in place to get vaccines to the countries that have had um, too little access to them. So, uh, you know, it, especially across the developing world. So without leadership on that front, I think we're going to be plagued by, you know, these sporadic shortages. Um, and then as long as we're still uh, in the midst of, of um, you know, pandemic related uh, adaptation in the United States, you're going to see this, this, um, this shift toward goods that, you know, that's that's really um, clogging up our ports. All right. What about inflation, though? I mean, that's uh, I just I heard a couple of weeks ago that, you know, we probably shouldn't be calling it transitory uh, mm -hmm. or actually for, at first it was like we're calling it transitory with a tail because it's mm -hmm. going to last a lot longer than we thought. And then a few days ago, I thought, well, maybe we shouldn't even be talking about it in terms of it being transitory. Well, there's definitely a transitory component of it. It's not all transitory, clearly, because. I mean, it's probably going to last at least another year. So we think of transitory as a year or less generally, and you know, it's going to be here for longer than a year. But there is a transitory component in that what people were really referring to at that point was that trough in prices that we hit last year. So prices really, you know, a lot of prices actually declined last year. And so some of that inflation that we're seeing is a bounce back from that point. But it's being sustained by this um, continued increase in, uh, in demand. And to the degree that prices that sorry that wages do start to rise more in step with inflation if labor market shortages continue. In that case, you know, it, it may be buoyed also by these wage increases, like Dan was saying, that do affect input prices for producers and therefore the prices that they have to, to charge on their goods. So I think inflation will be with us for quite a while. I think the big question is whether it's an inflation that undermines confidence in, um, in you know, by, for consumers, for investors, or whether it's an inflation that people really recognize as being part of this, this historic recovery from a massive shock, uh, which was the, the great lockdowns. So, you know, to the degree that the inflation is still accompanied by the, the, the people who've been um, less well compensated in our society catching up it, it needn't be an unhealthy thing. It needn't be uh, the same kind of inflation that sent us all into a panic in the 1970s. So we'll just have to wait and see how it turns out. Dan, what's your outlook? Well, and, and, and uh, you know, this partly depends on, on the management uh, from the Fed and other people. And, and, and that's, uh, let me say for food and agriculture, uh, uh, you tell me how much it's going to rain here in California in the next uh, <laughs> few months, and, I, and I'll give you some good numbers. Uh, <laughs> it, but but uh, more generally, uh, I do think uh, as, as uh, we get a little bit of relaxation at the ports, and it doesn't take a lot, we'll be able to get uh, the commodities shipped out of California. In terms of food prices for all of us, I don't see them uh, going back down, but I don't see any particular reason for regular uh, uh, abnormally high food price increases either going forward. As Katie says, labor costs and other things uh, filter through as input costs throughout the, the system. Uh, we don't yet know whether uh, food at home and away from home uh, is going to get back to normal. It, uh, uh, back in 2019, we were spending half our food budget away from home. A lot of that on services, not for the food products themselves, but as services that uh, came with them. And uh, I'm not saying we're all going to stay at home baking banana bread all day uh, uh, like 2020, but, uh, but we may have developed uh, um, a, a little more food at home culture here in the United States uh, over the pandemic. And, and we'll sort of see how that plays out. And I don't think anybody's got a great handle on that yet. So did I hear you say that uh, you think that food prices will not go back down? So, so once these supply chain issues are resolved, 
do you think that food prices will come down? Will that portion of the rise in price fall back down? I, I don't see it falling back down. I don't see that in the cards. Now, great weather here or there or, or something in, 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 you know, we could, uh, pork prices go up and down, hog prices go up and down, but I don't see anything in the cards now to say food prices are likely to fall substantially next year. They may not rise as much as they did this year, but I don't see declines. But, you know, again, weather has a lot to do with this. Right. Katie, what about non-food uh, prices? Uh, once the supply issue, supply chain issues are resolved, do you see prices for other things maybe coming back down a bit? So I think the big question is whether the semiconductor issues will be resolved and what's going to happen with car prices. Uh, it's, it's really hard for me to to be able to forecast, you know, what's going to happen with the supply of cars over the next year. Um, I mean, it's not always that way, right? Like sometimes in, in normal times, one can make some reasonable um, suppositions, but but at this point, it's really tricky. And we also see these sporadic um, cutbacks in capacity that are related to the pandemic, and, um, other, you know, outside of just the semiconductor chip availability. So. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's you know the cars, the new and used cars are really a huge driver of that that non-food inflation. Also, energy prices. Um, so there are a number of different um, shocks, and then also um, you know collusion among big producers and our reliance on fossil fuels that sustain these um, these massive increases sometimes in in energy prices. Um, so it's um, you know it, it, those two things are going to be the big question. Right. All right. So I guess the saga continues. Yeah. <laughs> this has been a really great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your work and your insight. Thank you. Thank you. Katie Russ is a professor of economics at UC Davis, and Dan Sumner is the Frank H. Buck Jr. Distinguished Professor of Agricultural and Resource Economics at UC Davis. Until next time, we'll be back in the new year. I'm Satirius Johnson, and this is UC Davis Live. Bye-bye.